Today's webinar is entitled The ECJ Privacy Ruling Explained by Max Schrems and three top EU and US privacy experts and is brought to you by the European American Chamber of Commerce, where Europeans and Americans connect to do business. I'm Todd Schwartz, Executive Director of the Cincinnati Chapter of the EACC, and I will be your host today. We have over 275 people registered for today's event from around the world, so I'm sure that we're going to have a vibrant transatlantic and international discussion. One quick disclaimer, please note all comments and opinions presented by our speakers today are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the European American Chamber of Commerce or its members. Let me now introduce my colleague Yvonne Bendegarroschild. Uh, Yvonne is the Executive Director of the New York Chapter of the EACC, and she will introduce our topic and our panelists. Yvonne, over to you. Thank you, Todd. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our discussion about the European Code of Justice decision on the Privacy Shield. Uh, we hosted a panel on the Privacy Shield when it was enacted a few years back, and when this latest decision was about to be announced, we decided to have a reunion of our original panelists including, of course, Max, the plaintiff, to update our members on what the latest decision means for their, um, for their business and what they need to do next. Concrete, our panel will discuss why Max filed the complaint, how the new ruling will affect transatlantic data exchange in both directions, the difference between US and EU sentiments about privacy, and how the European Court of Justice decision um, has changed how business is being conducted um, by entities with operations in the US and in Europe. Our speakers include Max Schrems, Angelo Steele, John Whelan, Tom Sinch. And an important note, um, since webinars don't allow us to meet in person, we offer our members to connect with one another um, and with the other participants of the webinar. So please let us know if you want to connect with anyone you will see on the attendee list that we send out after the event. And Angelo Steele, a partner of Troutman Pepper, is our moderator today. He will start the discussion and set the stage and introduce the subject. Angelo, over to you. Thank you, Vaughn. Um, good morning, uh, everyone. I'm uh, honored to be part of this panel uh, in our second time around when we were uh, when the decision first came down, I was growing up, there used to be Ollie Foreman fights. It was Ollie Foreman one, Ollie Foreman two, Ollie Foreman three. Um, so we are in the, uh, the second, uh, the sequel to uh, Max Schramm versus um, the data protection uh, organization in Facebook uh, for the second version of privacy rights. We have a really great panel that we put together today um, from attorneys both in the United States and over in Europe, and as well our um, star Max Schrems. I'll start with uh, introducing our panel. We have uh, Tom Zeich uh, from um, Cleveland, Ohio. Tom's a partner with Thompson Hine LLP. He's a chair of the firm's privacy and security team, and he was one of the founding chairs of the American Bar Association's Privacy and Data Security Committee. Um, we're honored to have Tom on the committee. Um, our next panelist is John Whalen. John uh, is located in Dublin, Ireland. Uh, John is a partner with AL Goodbody, uh, and he is the head of the firm's commercial and technology group. And finally, um, rounding out the panel is Max Schrems. Max uh, is a lawyer. He's an author. Um, he's a privacy rights advocate. He's a Facebook user, um, and he's the founder of NOYB. Uh, European Center for Digital Rights, and NOIB stands for um, not, not Your Business, Max, is that correct? Um, it's a nonprofit organization that uh, launches strategic cases and media initiatives in support of privacy rights. Um, before we get into some of the subject matter, we just want to take a, an audience poll of three questions so that we can tailor what the discussion would be. So Angelo, just so the, the, uh, you should be, able, everybody should see the results now. 64% uh, of our audience uh, works for an organization that transfers data into or out of the United States. Uh, interestingly, about 10% do not know uh, whether their company uh, organization moves stuff in. Um, 
uh, a little more spread out on the safeguards. 42% are relying on contractual clauses. 13% uh, are using the privacy shield. So they must be among that, uh, I think 5,300 companies that have privacy shield arrangements. Um, not surprisingly, nearly 20%, one out of five are saying they don't know what safeguards they employ. Um, and again, a number of companies uh, or individuals saying they do not transfer information into or out of Europe. Finally, um, uh, and I'm surprised by this, I don't know how the uh, panelists feel, 44% uh, say yes, their organization does have a plan to uh, address the uh, ruling. 20% um, say no. Uh, and a third, they do not know if their organization has a plan to uh, address the recent ruling. So um, let's throw it out and, and start off with setting the table a little bit. Max, um, you filed um, SHREMS 1, um, which involved a challenge to uh, safe harbor provisions. SHREMS 2 um, took on the U.S. Privacy Shield and um, model contractual clauses. Can you give us some background of why the case was filed and what your specific concerns were? So basically, this whole case started after um, Snow the Snowden um, disclosures about US surveillance. And within Europe, there was kind of this idea of, you know, that's simply what the NSA does, nothing we can really do about it. And it started actually with a journalist calling me saying, you know, is that actually legal for European companies to feed into um, American companies that we know have to then forward the data to the NSA. That was kind of this string of steps of, you know, where the data is actually coming from. And um, the interesting thing is that under European law, you're not allowed to send data abroad unless you can guarantee um, an adequate level of protection and, and also respect for fundamental rights in the EU. So um, we basically have a kind of data export um, regime that kind of is very limited in, in how much you can send data abroad. The rationale behind it is obviously if you have privacy laws in Europe and then you just shift the data to another country and you do whatever you want to do with it, then the whole system in Europe would break down. So that's kind of the, the background story. Now, the first case was really about safe harbor and US surveillance and the Court of Justice already found back then that the US law is, is um, when it comes to surveillance, not adequate. Um, that also struck down the safe harbor. And um, for me, the point that we had to make was done and I didn't really care too much about this anymore because I think it was important for the Court of Justice in Europe to say, you know, to set these red lines. Now what happened is that especially industry was pushing a lot for a new deal. So basically what the European Commission has done is they took safe harbor, which was invalidated, basically put a new name on top of it, added a couple of things to the old um, system, but it's basically the old safe harbor. They just renamed the privacy shield. And a lot of the companies shifted to so-called standard contractual clauses, which is another transfer tool. So um, probably to set the stage there, but there is the general rule, you're not allowed to send data abroad. And then there's exemptions under Article 49 for totally necessary data transfers. And then there are a couple of transfer tools um, that you can use to kind of um, outsource data to the US, stuff like that. Um, and Facebook, the company that we dealt with, um, actually used these SECs, these standard contractual clauses. And in these SECs, it says, it says that you can sign this contract and that's all fine but you're not allowed to use it if there's conflicting law in the recipient country. And that's exactly what we said is true in the US because the surveillance law, mainly FISA 702, has not gone away um, since then. And um, there is no reason why the first judgment wouldn't apply to all these other instruments as well. Um, the Irish regulator that's in charge of it then did not actually decide on it but instead stopped the procedure and filed against me and Facebook, which was super interesting for the probably only the lawyers in the room, is that I was actually a defendant in this case and um, basically argued that the SECs would be invalid. We said the SECs are perfectly valid because you're not allowed to use them in certain situations um, if transferring data to the US. And, but what we ar argued is that this privacy shield decision should have never come out the way um, it should have come out. Uh, it, it did come out and, and basically it, with 20 steps in between the court basically joined uh, us on all the points we raised and said that on the one hand, privacy shield is again invalid, just like safe harbor before, more or less for the same reasons. And secondly, that the standard contractual clauses are valid. That's the headline. But a lot of people seem to have ignored the second line in that headline, 
which was they are only valid because you are not allowed to use them if in a case-by-case -case analysis you realize that in the foreign country the surveillance law does not meet European standards and that's basically if you read the judgment fully um, what the, what's the conclusion on Pfizer 702. So I think right now our position is that you can use the SCCs with the US if you're not a company that falls under any of these surveillance laws. But if you fall under Pfizer, which is typically um, defined in US law as electronic communication service providers, then you can sign the SCCs, but you're not allowed to use them. And that is a big chunk of the data transfers we have to the, EU, uh, to the US that fall under that. I hope that's a short summary that kind of. No, thank you, Max. That, that was, that, I think that was very helpful to set the table. So I want to throw it over to John right now. And John, um, Max set the table. As an attorney in Dublin, you're on the ground. What issues does this decision now raise for entities in Europe who transfer information cross-border? Uh, thanks, Angelo. I think maybe just add firstly just a bit of color, or maybe Irish procedural color to um, what Max had set out there and, and the timings. So yeah, it was some time ago, June 2013, um, when Max made his, his first complaint and um, that wasn't investigated. Um, the DPC at the time decided that it was unsustainable um, and she, that the DPC was uh, judicially reviewed in the Irish court. Um, and that went in front of the High Court and uh, Judge Hogan, um, who's now in Europe himself, um, looked at that and, and, and compared uh, the Snowden revelations to Irish law um, in the first instance in the Irish constitution and, uh, and the guarantee to, to, to privacy within that and applying his Irish test to that um, this way's concerns and he referred it uh, to Europe um, and that's as we know trends one and uh, in, the, in, in the course of that um, uh, case as Max says safe, safe harbour was struck down. I think um, it is maybe important just to make a slight distinction between trends one and two insofar as the, the level of analysis that was done of US law. And, and I think there, there wasn't a detailed analysis in the, in the, on the first round. Um, and a lot of it focused on the commission decision itself not being um, uh, validly um, arrived at. Um, but, but fast forward and, and Max has come through a, you know, a similar process again with regard to standard contractual clauses. And again, I think the Irish court in, in fairness to, 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 to Max and generally uh, gave you know, a fair hearing to this, probably a bit, took a bit longer than people would have liked, um, but also felt that this was a matter um, that should be referred uh, to Europe and, and that's where we are now. In terms of what the um, case decided, um, you know, just purely from a legal perspective, I think it can be, um, divided into kind of four core aspects. There was 11 questions put to the court, um, but four aspects. One is what the applicable legal test for transfers under SEC should be. Um, secondly, supervisory authorities' obligations. Um, thirdly, the validity or otherwise of the SEC decision. Um, and then fourthly, uh, the court looked at the Privacy Shield and, and US law in much more detail than, as you know, the US government was represented. So there was a full outing this time around in terms of an analysis of, of, of US law. Um, looking at those very briefly, um, the applicable law, uh, questions two, three, and six, um, the court decided that, uh, that the third country to where you are transferring, and this isn't just the US, it's, it's any country to which um, a company is transferring data, has to provide an essentially equivalent level of protection to that provided um, under EU law. Now, there was some debate around what EU law is, um, and that was decided to be the GDPR read in conjunction with the Charter of Fundamental Rights. And that's an important point because um, it, it may puzzle some um, US uh, lawyers when they say, well, why, isn't, why didn't the court look at national laws in, in Europe, you know, which have their own regimes not dissimilar, possibly, in some cases to uh, the US. But this was a legal point and the test is EU law, as I say, the GDPR. And the factors to be taken into account is whether there's appropriate safeguards, enforceable rights and effective uh, legal remedies. Secondly, um, on the supervisory authority obligations, very briefly, question eight, uh, the, the, the court made it clear that the supervisory authorities have a responsibility to monitor 
compliance with GDPR and have a responsibility to act. And um, so I think that's, you know, I've heard Max emphasize that as being an important finding uh, by the court. Um, third area, the validity of the SEC decision. And as Max said, this is question seven and 11. Um, it was found to be valid, but, you know, absolutely subject to, um, uh, or, or on the basis that uh, there is an obligation on the, 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 the parties to terminate, or in particular the controller to terminate, um, if there isn't an adequate level of, of, of treatment. Um, and the court explained that um, the SEC's stand as valid, but supplementary measures may be uh, looked at and probably suggesting need to be looked at. So that's really, I think, what industry, and we can come back to that, is um, uh, looking at uh, currently is, is what, that me what the meaning of supplementary measures um, uh, is. And then finally, um, the court found itself, and I think um, Max has his own story as to how this came into the picture, but looking at Privacy Shield, Privacy Shield wasn't part of the original case. It, it came in um, subsequently. Um, but the court looked at that and, and again looked at Article 7 and 8 um, uh, 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 of the uh, uh, Charter and said that the, in particular, the two regimes that the court looked at, and, and Tom can speak to these, um, the 702 FISA and the EO 12333, um, which were the two kind of uh, uh, focus points in, with regard to national surveillance, um, did not have what was required in terms of clear and precise rules um, into how they were implemented. And secondly, that neither, neither provided um, uh, effective um, uh, judicial review. Um, and the Privacy Shield Ombudsman uh, didn't uh, uh, um, uh, save Privacy Shield. So, so that's how we ended up with the Privacy Shield being, being knocked out as a result. So, so they're the kind of the four key areas of finding by the court. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, Tom, I want to throw it over to you now. Um, what I want to focus on is the U.S. side, and I'm sure your phone has been ringing, what issues has this decision now raised for U.S. companies that engage in cross-border transfer of information? Yeah, there are a lot of discrete issues, but I think it's important to see what the picture is. We've got American businesses like around the world in the midst of you know, unprecedented uncertainty. And whether you're the general counsel, the chief information officer, the security officer, whoever you are, or the last thing you needed right now was more uncertainty, but that's exactly where we are. And it's because litigation, and I speak as someone who's litigated a lot of my career, litigation for public policy is a very blunt instrument, right? You put a case in front of it, you pick an unsympathetic defendant like Facebook uh, that has its own issues, and then you lay out and you get a judgment in a case that is on its facts, and companies have to, businesses, nonprofits, whoever we're talking about, need to react and continue to do their business while they're trying to do everything else they need to do to comply and succeed. And so what we have then is, like anything else, a business has a series of choices to make, right? It has, it has options to take, and it can't design a system that it doesn't control because we have here, and, and forgive me for using a, uh, an American sports metaphor, maybe we can transpose it for our European guests, but there's the NCAA, which is the body that governs collegiate sports in America, and there's the old joke that the NCAA gets so upset at the University of Kentucky that it puts Cleveland State on probation, right? What we've heard is the animating force behind these decisions is the uh, unhappiness uh, and alarm at uh, the perceptions of American surveillance. I'm not gonna debate that. We've got that debate already going on in the United States for 20 years. But be that as it may, that is a unhappiness with federal government surveillance mechanisms. The clients I deal with have exactly zero impact on that, right? There's nothing they can do to change those conditions to meet what the, uh, the DPAs and others are being asked to judge. So what they have to do is say, okay, there's still a great deal of uncertainty left by this decision, uh, as John has stated. And so what do we do? What are the choices we have? Obviously a choice is non-compliance. We don't counsel that, nor is anyone seriously looking at that if they've got European operations because of the severe level of fines that GDPR uh, brings to you. So that's off the, that's off the uh, table. Likewise, non-compliance with other US laws is off the table. I'll get to that in a second. So you look at the mechanisms that are still available or arguably still available. Uh, 
going back a few years when companies were looking at the privacy shield, uh, again, aside from anyone's view about whether it was or was not a change uh, in the existing mechanism, relatively few companies went through that. They looked at the time, they read between the lines and thought this is a remedy on borrowed time. So to build an entire compliance mechanism around it was building on sand. Uh, and you can't just, these are not something you can do overnight, right? You know, to do privacy shield compliance was a very long process. And you looked at binding corporate rules, which a much smaller group of companies did, fewer did because it's a longer and even more uncertain process. So we look to one of two choices uh, practically. One is to shut down data flows, to say, okay, we're going to have the lowest risk uh, option by not transferring any data to the United States or making it accessible. And for most businesses, that's completely unrealistic and unfeasible. I know the Berlin uh, DPA recently said that this is the you know, that this is a decision so that Europe can declare you know information independence. Sounds great, but for businesses' point of view, it means shutting down communications across the border. And we can go through all of the all the, the processes that would interrupt talent management, legal compliance, product safety. Uh, anti-bribery statutes, all those things that you need data to do. And it isn't just running your business, shutting down those flows. If it happens involuntarily, we're going to have to deal with that. But that's nothing anyone wants to do because simply the way businesses are run, there really isn't a border uh, for the data because we've got employees moving back and forth. We've got products moving back and forth. We have designs, we have product liability claims, everything else that cross borders necessarily. So we cling to and what folks are looking at are those standard, standard contractual clauses. It's something parties ramped up. Uh, I've seen already revisions to them and working with clients on seeing what they can do to bring them up to date. But if you read between, if you read the, the, the judgment carefully, as Max and John have summarized it, we're still left with uncertainty because again, there's nothing I can put in a contract that would tell the Department of Homeland Security what it can do. I mean, under 12 triple three, they could go to Ireland. Right? We know they could go to Ireland and get the data. Are any of us happy about that? Probably not, but that's the reality. So we're living in a world in which the companies affected by this decision have exactly zero impact on meeting the concerns. And so the best they can do is to build compliance around, the, uh, around their data flows, using the clauses, not only with their own organization, but all the third parties they deal with look at ways that they're independently using to protect data, whether it's encryption, uh, all the information security and the like. I mean, there's a myth that Americans don't care about this, right? But I will tell you that I spend more time working with clients, protecting the data they have from people who ought not have it. Um, that, that's where we're going. We're trying to maximize that. There's lots of legal reasons and risk mitigation reasons to do that anyway, uh, but that's where we're moving. And so we're living with this uncertainty so long as Europe is still, the NCAA is still upset at Kentucky, the rest of us are, are in the crosshairs and are, are having to face the decision and we are doing the best we can. I don't see people yet preparing for 100% data localization that all European data has to stay there. Uh, the cost is prohibitive. Uh, the cost not only in investment, but in terms of just running a business that way, that I don't see that. If it happens involuntarily, then we'll have to deal with that. But we're what the, the companies I work with uh, are doing the best they can to protect the data, uh, to implement and use the standard contractual clauses, uh, and to up the game every way they can. Thank you very much, Tom. I, I want to um, throw it back over to Max for a second. And, and, and Max, um, I think this is you know your sweet spot. UE residents, um, what's the big deal with privacy? Shouldn't national security take precedence over um, privacy rights in appropriate cases? Um, so actually to answer that, it, it's, you need to go in a couple of layers. So first of all, one problem is that especially FISA 702, but also 12333 has a, goes far beyond what we would usually call national security. That goes, I mean, we know from PPD 28 that it's uh, the threat of a transnational crime that is already enough to do box surveillance. So it's, it's, it's not national security in the sense of uh, terrorism uh, kind of really on a large scale that really threatens the security of a nation in that sense. A lot of it is simply also espionage. And that is the other issue that I think uh, we have to mention a bit is there is oftentimes some simply misaligned interests. Um, there are situations if it's international terrorism where definitely everybody in the world or in the Western world is on the same side. 
Um, but a lot of these authorities were also used to spy on the EU, on, you know, on, on diplomats, etc. And that is then not in the national interest of the EU, but to the exact contrary of it. So I think um, to just say, you know, there is a national security that we're all interested in, does not work if that is oftentimes misaligned. To give you a very practical example, Austria is a neutral country. We're not a NATO member. We're still in the EU, but um, we have a lot of trade with Russia. We have a lot of trade with Iran. Um, a lot of the international organizations are here. So there is oftentimes a different political interest simply um, and kind of feeding a foreign espionage system is kind of awkward on that. Um, so I think that is one part. The other thing is that privacy just is not just the direct impact. It's also the feeling of not being surveilled. And I think that's important to stress that people just behave differently or, or feel pressured or cannot you know, exercise their freedom of speech or just won't do it because it has these chilling effects of possibly if I say that, I don't know, I don't get a visa next time I wanna to go to the US. So there's a lot of these elements that, that are involved and it's not that simple, unfortunately. Um, that's the first thing. The other two things that I just wanted to kind of quickly um, touch on, um, because John has quickly talked about the supplementary measures, and I hear that point being made a lot. The background of, of, this, of this part of the judgment is that we looked into 12333, so basically surveillance outside of the U.S. and international cables and so on. And it was actually an argument that we made to say, you know, it could be possible to overcome that problem if there is proper encryption and so on um, in transit. I don't think that these uh, supplementary measures is something that can realistically, or at least I haven't heard of any solution that can do that, um, help with companies that fall under 702 directly. Um, so that is, that is something just on the supplementary measures. I think there are, there's sometimes a bit much hope put into them <laughs> that then, then realistically achievable. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is there is also article 49 that is oftentimes left out of the picture. So 49 allows for the so to say, crucially necessary data transfers. So a lot of the points that um, Tom was just mentioning is stuff that could be done under 49.2 and you don't necessarily need the SECs for that. I, I'm fully aware that you need it for a lot of other things, but um, a lot of like the, the, the crucially necessary transfers could be done under 49. And the interesting thing is 49 does not require adequacy or, or kind of any kind of makeup, it simply waives these prohibi prohibition of data transfers. So under 49, you can even send data to North Korea and you're out of this whole equivalence debate. Um, and I think that is for many cases, a very stable solution if, if you fall under it. The very last thing that I just wanted to mention is there is one thing that US business can do as well, which is talking to their congressmen. <laughs> and, um, because a lot of these surveillance laws were changed within the US. I mean, we know that the 12, 215 program was um, looked into and there were changes in the law. I think it would be super interesting if, if US business is, is also saying, you know, um, maybe we can, you know, improve the, the protections for foreigners as well, because they're our customers and we need that trust from them if they will want to have their data. That's something we try to advocate a lot right now. Hey, Max, quick follow-up question, a short one, but if the U.S. changed their surveillance laws and instead of having broad surveillance um, and the ability to uh, extract data, but the focus was on proof of a specific identifiable individual and it met a, f a certain threshold where national security would be jeopardized, would that concern that you have still be present? I think that part would probably kill the whole material law debate we have on surveillance. And that's a bit like in simple terms, what is, is true for American citizens, basically the fourth amendment kind of approach um, is definitely going to be enough from a European perspective. There is one other element, which may be a bit harder to overcome, which is redress. So it, we're not just talking about the fact that you're not surveilled, but also the fact that you can go to some court and have a like reasonable chance that you're going to be heard and so on. And there, one of the big problems we had in the whole case, not going to go into all of the details, but was standing under the US Constitution. And that is something where at least some kind of delayed notice or so could overcome even that problem. And that would be probably also a huge step for, for Americans if, if they are notified even 10 years later um, that they were under surveillance, that would allow even US citizens to bring cases if they feel that that surveillance was going too far against their own government. But both I, of that is nothing we're going to get in like a week. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Thank you, Max. Hey, John, I want to throw a, a question to you from the audience. Um, and, and here's the question. Um, in our 
audience poll, they talked about consent as a mechanism um, for valid transfers. If you have a global organization and they want to transfer data cross border um, for human resources purposes, so just employees of the organization, would consent be a valid mechanism to do so? I was with you there, Angelo, on that question and was proposing a particular answer, but then you took a left turn at the end with regard to mentioning employees. Um, so the first point is that consent is a, a, a derogation under which you can transfer uh, personal data overseas. Um, and of course, that is available to companies sending uh, uh, data to the US. Um, there's a practical matter that it is quite a high um, burden in terms of, of, of the level of consent. It has to be explicit, explicit uh, specific and informed. I think, you know, as, as a proposal to deal with this issue, um, the informed piece is, is going to be difficult because it involves, you know, informing um, individuals about the issues with regard to the adequacy of, of US laws, which, you know, query whether that is something that's um, um, going to be fully understood in the context of, you know, where you have a very large number um, of, of consumers, say. Um, but it is absolutely um, uh, an option. Um, it doesn't fit with um, every business model um, and it, you know, poses challenges in, in terms of being revocable at any particular point in time. So for, for US organizations who have significantly large numbers of, of consumers, it, it's, it's going to pose an issue. Uh, on, on the side of employees, um, there's a different consideration comes into play because generally speaking, um, uh, because of the relationship between em employee and employer, um, it's very difficult to um, uh, uh, justify processing on the basis of consent because of that imbalance. So that poses a, a, um, its own difficulties. I think in terms of the debate then, but what about an organization who you know, wants to, uh, to transfer data? It touches back, it comes back to the point, um, you know, that Max was discussing there around the supplementary measures and, you know, we touched on encryption and, for example, it not being an answer to 702. But I think what companies are going to have to do is, you know, look at a, if possible, a suite of measures and, and encryption may be one of them. But, but also, um, you know, there is, well, there's not entire clarity as to whether, you know, the test is a simple black and white one do the domestic laws um, on the whole, um, uh, sorry, are they to be considered? And if they don't meet the test, then no transfer can take place. Or is it on a case by case basis? And I think the, you know, there's a lot of commentary to suggest that it is you know, going to have to be on a case by case basis because otherwise you, you switch off um, international commerce. Um, and, and when it is on a case by case basis, you will look at the, the nature of the data, how you're transferring it, you know, data minimization and um, present possibly part data localization or, or, or full data localization um, um, down the line. But all of these measures, the supplementary measures that have to put in place will take time. So this isn't going to happen overnight. And I think, you know, one of the kind of practical um, issues for, for, for companies at the moment that, that we're seeing is, you know, even the regulators are saying, you know, they don't have a solution. I mean, there's an element um, of you know passing the parcel almost here at, at the moment you know the court of justice says the regulators must act and companies must act and um, the regulator is saying um, well we don't know the solution but in the meantime companies must comply and if they can't comply then they must notify us that they can comply and then we can go to the European Data Protection Board so there's a lot of uncertainty and then there's the polit political side which, which you touched on and whether the court of justice was you know giving a shove to the commission <laughs> Um, to go back to the table or to the to the to the U.S. government, and um, you know, does that all that piece? And again, the regulators are saying, you know, that's the preserve of the commission and not and not of the regulators. So, I, I think at the moment, you know, there's just I come back to the point of there's uncertainty. The supplementary measures are being looked at, and, and I think we do just need to, as as Helen Dixon says, you know, pause. That's what the Court of Justice is saying. Um, and I do think, you know, we, we do need this guidance. They're going to be working on it, you know, as soon as possible. But companies probably can't get ahead of that. So it's about just starting 
um, uh, to work out a plan and I was encouraged by um, the, the number on the poll of you know 44% have started to work on a plan and I think that's what people need to do. Can I just add one short thing probably on that? I mean, the case by case basis, at least from how it came out of the procedure, was mainly the question, do you fall under one of these surveillance laws in the US or not? Um, so the DPC and others have suggested that the whole US is terrible. And we have really, which was weird as an activist, had the middle ground in this case. We said, you know, you have to differentiate between different companies in the US. If you're an, a hotel provider, you're not falling under 702. So there's no problem in like stopping the data flows because of that. Now, um, the definition in US law is somewhat clear. There's a so-called electronic communication service provider. It's in 50 US co code 1881, if I'm correct. Um, and there you can see if your business falls under 702. And I think that is, um, we also um, put that on our webpage for businesses to just even send a questionnaire to the US side to say, you know, do you fall under that or not? Which is, I think the first and the biggest and probably 90% of what you can do under this case by case analysis. Um, there is additional questions about like um, data transfers being encrypted, stuff like that, which I assume is a general minimum standard anyways. Um, but I think once a company falls under 702, there is hardly any kind of additional measure you can take because under US law, you're simply obliged to hand over that data unless you get like fully encrypted data that you yourself don't know and can't access or something like that. But I don't think that that's practical for most business situations. Yeah, let me, if, if I can, real quickly uh, to that is I think that's a very optimistic view uh, because you'd like to say that the DPAs, supervisory authorities, will do nothing more than, than look at the applicability of those two statutes. From your lips to God's ear, I really hope that that's what happens. In listening to what the supervisory authorities are saying already, I'm not sure that's the case. And if I'm an American company saying, what, what do I have to do? And if I fall outside of one of those two regimes, I'm good. Um, I'm not supposed to give clients overly optimistic advice. And so I've got to be a little more uh, nuanced in how we describe that. I mean, one thing uh, just to add on that just real quick is also the sub processes in the sense of you may be a hotel chain, but your processor in turn is a 702 company, which if you outsource it to Google or Microsoft, 90% of the cases, this will happen anyways. And it's, it's really tricky. Hey, Tom, I want to throw it back over to you with another audience question. Um, and the question is, um, under Section 702 of FISA, um, how often, if you know, do U.S. companies resist it? And what defenses do they have if they are asked um, to provide information? Um, understanding I have obligations of confidentiality. Um, I think it is rare uh, for a private company uh, to resist. I think there are advocacy groups, there are others who will do it, but it is given the procedural posture, the way the court is set up, and again, the realistic choices companies have to make, I think it's the rare case that you're going to get a full-throated uh, opposition uh, in the actual proceeding. What you tend to have is the way we our, our clients deal with government regulators in, in a lot of uh, areas is you contact the human beings uh, who are behind it, who are seeking this, to the extent that there is a conversation to seek to uh, find bounds and to, uh, to work out what compliance looks like. But the, real, the short answer to the question is they rarely do because the prospects of success are so low. Great. Hey, John, back over to you. Um, the EU-US Privacy Shield is dismantled. What impact does this decision have on the Swiss-US Privacy Shield? Well, the Court of Justice was, was quite clear that adequacy decisions, um, while they remain in force, are binding on um, supervisory authorities and um, uh, the relevant uh, uh, country. Uh, so to my knowledge, um, unless others have heard, I, I don't believe the Swiss um, arrangement has been opened up again. So it, it remains valid. It's shut down as well. No, no, I, I, no it's open, it, it remains unaffected. Okay. It remains a book. One addition, just to probably add that, um, there is a problem for transfers that oftentimes happen, EU, Switzerland, then onwards, because the question is, can Switzerland stay adequate if it's basically loophole to do the privacy shield, again, that was found to be inadequate from a European level. So 
I think in reality, it's, it's going to be hard to use if you have like any kind of EU entity involved in a transfer. But if it's an only Swiss to, to, to US transfer, then Switzerland is a neutral country. They can do their own deals as they wish. And, and you have to look at this organizationally. If you're only the only place in all of Europe you're communicating with is Switzerland, you've got a mechanism. But again, very few companies are organized that their only contact with an entire yeah. continent is Switzerland. And it's so that may survive. That make use of that really. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, Tom, while you're uh, on the screen here, um, were U.S. companies blindsided by this decision? If they are paying attention, no. If blindsided in the sense of surprised, um, uh, disappointed in the outcome, or they had bet the other way, no. Um, I think anyone who had read the earlier decision uh, we had those discussions at the time saying, you know, logically, well, how does it apply? So I don't think they're blindsided. I think um, they are disconcerted. And it brings home um, a, a real key point for them. And that is when, again, dealing with general counsel, if we look at a legal function whose job is to ensure legal compliance with a very broad range uh, of laws, it brings into really sharp relief some Hobson's choices that they have. I'll give you one. Um, we have our anti-bribery statute, right? The, the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, which benefits not only American business in terms of integrity and transparency, but indeed protects foreign uh, governments from undue American financial influence. And companies have an absolute obligation to investigate facts that indicate that someone's bribing a foreign official, giving uh, illegal payments or benefits. And you can't do that. You can't do an investigation without information, right? So you've got to go get it. And so we have situations where it is almost impossible to reconcile complying with anti-bribery statutes, which are about protecting people from unlawful conduct, conduct around the world and how you get your hands on that. So if in blindsided in terms of their life becoming much more complicated, um, doing HR compliance, uh, you know, dealing with tax laws and the like that require actual live information uh, in actual systems that cost many millions of dollars, um, yeah, they are uh, continued to be. It's, it, the blindsiding is not just what happened in this decision, but the issue, again, of being caught in the middle of a situation about which they have little control other than petitioning their Congress people. We can talk about how likely that is to change executive action. Um, but, you know, they're, they're caught in the middle. And so I think whiplash is the better word uh, that they have uh, in what they're facing. And again, noncompliance is not an option. So, uh, it is, there is no solution. There literally is no solution that's clean and effective and fully compliant with all obligations. And so what they're doing is simply reacting as best they can. Um, I think a lot of our clients have been busy thinking about lots of other things like keeping their employees alive right now. Um, and so in the midst of all of that, um, I think this is a, a, just a level of complexity uh, that we have to deal with. Hey, Max, I got another question from the audience for you, I think. Um, 12 triple uh, three um, doesn't relate to data transfers per se. What relevance did it have or play in the court's decision? Yeah, so that was actually one point that, uh, so we focused mainly on 72 and 12 triple three was more like the side gig because um, one important distinction is on the 12 triple three, to my understanding, correct me if, if I'm wrong, there is no legal obligation by a company to kind of comply with 12333 in any way as it's an internal executive order. Um, that's different with 702 where you can get, you know, an order saying you actually have to provide this data. Now, 12333 was for us super important because of upstream and surveillance debates um, outside of the U.S. So um, that was especially relevant for the privacy shield situation. So basically, we have an agreement between the U.S. and the EU saying we are actually protecting your privacy. Now, the U.S. government walked into the courtroom and said, oh, that's only limited to our territory. If we basically screw you one inch outside of our international border, like our national borders, then we can do whatever we want to do. And that's not part of the deal. Um, and I think that didn't go down too well with the judges because, you know, if you basically have an agreement with another country and they say, you know, we just screw you one inch outside of our territory and therefore we're fine, that is probably not how an adequacy decision should work. And that basically got 12333 more into the picture. Um, it's definitely something, and that is something where we try to contain the damage of this judgment, so to say, for business. And that is where these supplementary measures come in. Because if you look, for example, another situation, 
let's say we transfer data to uh, New Zealand. That probably goes through 20 countries in the way, and there is no way that either the EU or New Zealand can guarantee that not 20 countries on the way are doing surveillance as well. Um, and the only way we can guarantee that is with a technical solution. And that is a bit that we try to kind of put in here to say, you know, um, that's true for the US as well. If there is a recipient in the US that is not falling under any obligation to co cooperate with the NSA or with any other authority in, in, in such a broad surveillance measure, um, and we can guarantee that on the way there, everything is fine through technical measures, for example, then that could be an option to still have transfers. The counter argument that came actually more from the judges than anybody else was to say, you know, what good, good is it that we transfer data to, let's say, a hotel in New York, if we know that it's also veiled on the way anyways. So we tried to kind of uh, get this in-between solution, and that is where these supplementary measures came in, uh, much more here than we've really never debated private, uh, safe, uh, to use the SECs and have like an additional text with it that could overcome some problem. Because as we mentioned before, there is no way to contract out of US law, like you're simply subject to it. And to probably one last sentence, just if, if anybody in this call is confused with all these details, on a very high level, what we have is a crash of on the one side, European law saying you need privacy, on the other side, US law saying you need surveillance. And there is no mechanism you can put in between if these two things simply collide. You have kind of too much law, a conflict of law situation. And uh, again, I don't think that any new deal or something is going to be able to overcome that because that new deal is just going to be crushed in between these two pillars. And that's why I highlight the, the hope somehow to, to get some movement in the US as well, because that was the problem with Privacy Shield back then is that they said we want to have a new deal, but they didn't really move on anything on the surveillance side of it. And then you had this deal that was bound to be broken, you know, as soon as it reaches Luxembourg the next time. If, if I could just real quick on that, um, and Max, I appreciate the desire to have an impact on American surveillance law. Trust me, I'm an American living in America. I face this more on a day-to-day -day basis than you do. Not downplaying your concern, but that's yeah. the context. Absolutely. Uh, but there's there's something we would like from the Europeans, and we have a doctrine in our law called comity, right? Um, and that is in making a decision, understanding that there are different legal systems that have their own standing and that not all of the things that we'd like to have, you know, we have comedy considerations in our competition laws, all kinds of laws. And we would like the Europeans to understand comedy and say, we have a view philosophically of privacy. This is the level we would like it. We will recognize other uh, legal concerns that are valid. If they're invalid, we don't care. But I think what, what the Americans would like very much as this is applied on the case by case basis, that there be a feeling of comedy uh, mm -hmm. in terms of understanding the limitations of even a large region's uh, legislative and judicial decisions. Yeah. The problem, just real quick on that, is that we're not talking about secondary legislation. We're talking about the Charter of Fundamental Rights that's part of the treaties. So there is simply no room I can see. There is, you can probably squeeze that a bit into a proportionality test. And I think the Court of Justice has said it doesn't have to be exactly the European level, but it has to kind of be, you know, somewhat close to it. Um, and we're also talking about the privileged access to, to the European market. And I think that's also, it's, it's, you know, basically the U.S. without having privacy shield is set to a standard that all the other countries in the world are at as well. And um, I think it's also not, you know, it's sometimes perceived to be cut out and be made you know, less, have less access to the European market than any other company, uh, country. It's, it's more the other way around that there was a privileged access for the US that is now gone. And I think from the realities, I think for, from the political side, there's a lot of will to, to, to look into all of that. But the court has simply said there is a limit in, in the fundamental rights and that can only be changed if 27 member states together change it. And that's, I just don't think that's overly realistic to happen. Hey, John, I want to throw a, a question from the U.S. over to you. Um, the uh, regulators in Europe, um, now that the privacy shield has been dismantled, um, are they going to immediately start to challenge companies and the me mechanisms they use to transfer um, information? And if not, is there going to be some sort of time window uh, to adapt to this new landscape? 
Um, well, in terms of the time scale, as, as we know, just to be clear, there's no grace period under on, on, under the court's judgment. So this privacy shield is invalid as of um, last week. Um, in terms of what they're going to do, again, it, it's a bit unclear. Um, we've seen uh, national DPAs and the Berlin DPA, as was mentioned, coming out with different statements. My, my, my sense is that, you know, they are under the kind of consistency obligations and, and, and general regime, um, you know, probably all going to themselves, wait for the EDPB guidance. Um, I, I know it's not the answer to everything, as, as Max has said, and, you know, we can all see the challenges that, that um, the EDPB itself has, but, you know, it has said that it will come out with recommendations, whether they be legal, technical or organisational. So, you know, that gives some light at the end of the tunnel that there may be um, a, a solution here. But I, I, it's unclear. Um, I think in terms of the Irish DPC, which is probably the most relevant to this discussion, um, and indeed for, for many te tech companies, there's obviously, you know, so, some options that it has under uh, domestic legislation in terms of um, own volition inquiries or enforcement action or a court application. But I, I think in terms of this particular case, and maybe a turn to Max would be interesting to hear where he thinks it, it, it's going, but certainly she has indicated that she needs to reformulate the complaint under GDPR, and um, given that it predated GDPR and, and now it has to take a, a slightly separate track. Um, but maybe, maybe over to Max, where, Max, where do you see things going uh, from here, maybe on the ground? We haven't published it. So uh, specifically to that case, I'm, I'm at the point where we will be very aggressive on the Irish DPC. This case pens for seven years. It was kicked to five courts by now. I'm done with waiting for further guidance. Like this case, we have 45,000 pages of documents on US surveillance law. I'm like, there is every argument was made here. So I don't think it's fair in any way to kind of delay this procedure any further. Uh, Facebook knew about it since seven years. They ignored the fact that they they fall under FISA. It's it's just to a level where it's unacceptable to to kind of even think about them delaying it further. And I mean, they're under an obligation from the court thing since 2016 to swiftly decide this case. And the reality is um, that would be contempt of court if they delay it further. And the penalty in the end is going to jail at some point. And after sitting here for seven years with the Irish DPC. I'm not willing to, to wait for this any longer. So that's this specific case. <laughs> and um, I think in the broader picture, um, what I think, I mean, definitely it's illegal and to, to further transfer data if there is no legal basis. One thing that people should be mindful of is different DPAs have very different views and different ways of enforcing it. So it highly depends on the country you're in. Uh, secondly, there's things like workers' councils, class actions, um, situations like that, that for specific industry sectors are a big factor. If your workers in Europe are just upset about the fact that data goes to the US anyways, they may initiate something and then a DPA would have to decide. Um, and I mean, for us ourselves, we would just kind of gradually move up. What I would do from a business perspective is to, for example, show and be able to demonstrate that you've quickly done something. Um, because even if there is, um, if it's found that a transfer is, is illegal, um, that doesn't mean that there has to be a full penalty. There's the possibility that a DPA says, you know, you've tried everything, you, you know, moved quickly. Um, we realize you've done everything you could do in the moment. So we just warn you to not do that anymore. But there is no like penalty in the sense of the 20 million or 4%. Um, if a company just says, oh, we just use Privacy Shield now, still three months later, and we don't think that we have to move it at all, then this probably this, you know, analysis for a penalty would be a bit different. <laughs> Hey, we got two minutes left, and I want to throw one question out to the panel. We'll start with Tom, uh, John, and then Max, you can finish it off. But what advice um, would you give companies to transfer data today? And one of the areas I'd like you to just think about is, is there any um, advice on the adequacy assessment um, with respect to uh, contractual clauses um, that, that you would give. So Tom, you want to start? Yeah, I mean, what, what we are advising clients so is take a look at the regime you have. We're always doing it. I mean, I'm like you put a regime in and, and let it go forever. It's to look at the mechanisms. I've got calls the rest of the week on this. Let's look at the regimes we have in place. Where can we practically affect and put 
additional safeguards in should we be challenged and make sure we're aligned that why we transfer this information is for good reason, right? No one does this just for the fun of it, right? We're, they're running businesses and need the data. And then to see what is it in, in concert with their overall spending plan, their overall feasibility plan to continue to protect the information. Because again, American businesses have been working to protect consumer information for years. And how do we refine those processes to protect the information and so it doesn't get in the wrong hands? Okay, what they're let, not me just doing, let me just, we're running out of time. Let me just get John's points yeah. real quick. I'm sorry to cut you off. John? Yeah, I think um, companies have you know no choice but to move towards the SECs and um, it's, it's, it's the logical place to go. Um, and uh, in terms of the adequacy assessment, you know, it is on a case by case basis. It has to be different for larger organizations to SMEs. And um, so I think just to Max's point, a plan, you know, start reacting to this, digest the judgment and see how it affects your organization and what you're doing. Hey, Max, why don't you close this out real quickly? Where do we go from here? So basically what, um, as a company, what I would do tomorrow is to kind of really ask my sub processors, make a list, be able to demonstrate that documented when a DPA comes around to kind of be able to say, that's what I really did. Um, and as I said, on our webpage, there's even a free questionnaire that, you know, you don't have to pay for it. You can just download it and use it. Um, and I think then another big point is the article 49. It's really for a lot of the crucially necessary data transfer, something you can use that is just in the law, you don't need to sign papers for it or anything like it. You just have to be realistic about when you can actually use it. Um, and I think the rest is then to a large extent to figure out if it's complicated to move data to Europe to not deal with it. Because one element is, I mean, there's definitely oftentimes an economic incentive to, to have it in the US. But if you look at all the compliance costs, which I mean, probably is the cost of most people in this call, which is lawyers and so on. The, oftentimes the compliance to move stuff to the US in certain situations is higher than just hosting it in Europe anyways. Um, and in many cases, you know, if it's just about storage or something like that, that is not an interactive situation. Um, that may be a way out as well that is sometimes not, you know, at the, at the front burner of people's thoughts. Thank you, Max. I, I think we're out of time. I want to throw it back over to Todd. Um, but Thank you panelists. And I wanna thank the audience too for um, sitting in and giving us questions to answer. Todd? That concludes today's webinar entitled the ECJ Privacy Ruling Explained by Max Schrems and three top EU and US privacy experts. Obviously again, thanks, thanks, thanks to Max Schrems, Angela Steele, John Wieland and Tim uh, Zitch for their insights, for your experience. Uh, for this very, very informative event. Thanks, of course, to our audience for joining in today's discussion. Just a reminder, all comments and opinions presented by our speakers today are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of the European American Chamber of Commerce or of its members. I'd encourage you to stay in touch with your local chapter of the European American Chamber of Commerce for information on upcoming webinars and events. Be sure to look for a recording of this event and for our other EACC webinars and events on our YouTube channel in the very near future. Thanks again to everybody and farewell. <laughs>